And welcome to this week's edition of Rev Talk. We're excited to be with you again. We're looking forward to having another great show for you uh, this evening and throughout the rest of the week. If you catch us on podcast or our video that we put out a little bit later, uh, three wonderful guests. And of course, we've had Keith Carr the first five weeks. We've got one of his uh, new hirees in athletic administration we're going to talk to uh, for Keith tonight. And that's uh, Tom Kleinlein. He's a wonderful guy. Had a chance to meet him back when we were doing Rev Talk at Boure, which can be a lot more fun, TK, than this. I'm just telling you. <laughs> he came, you came to a bunch of the Boure ones, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, the food, the food is definitely better than this one, that's for sure. I, I should have sent you a carryout from Boure, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, he, when he first arrived in Oxford in January, he came out to the show and, uh, of course, introduced himself to all of us. And we've had a chance to kind of hang out with him and get to know him a little bit. But a uh, wonderful guy. And a little bit later, in fact, in our second segment, we're going to go back into the world of football that Tom's over right now. We're going to hear from Kevin Smith, our running, back, uh, running backs coach, uh, who's brand new to Ole Miss, too. And our third segment got something kind of unique for us. He's been equipment manager at Ole Miss for several, several years. He just recently retired, but has got all kind of crazy stories. We're going to hear from John Possum Ross. And that could be an interesting one. I, I may have to uh, edit some stuff out of that one at a later point before we put it on there. But <laughs> we look forward to visiting with uh, Possum as well. Uh, TK was at Wake Forest uh, as a player back in the good old days, 1989 to 92, as an offensive lineman there. Played for Bill Dooley, who's Vince, Vince Dooley's brother. And they got to the 92 Independence Bowl. I'm going to talk about that here in just a little bit as well. And then, of course, got into administration. Uh, Spent seven years at Georgia Southern here recently as the AD. Was involved in a whole bunch of cool stuff there. A conference change and uh, improving the athletic budget there. And we'll get him to talk about that. And prior to that was at Kent State. Uh, and was at Arizona State, as he mentioned just a moment ago, for several years. And um, originally from New York, Inwood, New York. Tom and his wife, Tara, have two sons, Austin and Mason. And uh, I've been asking everybody, TK, about what it's like being at home all the time and kind of cooped up like this. I know you're a go-getter, so this has got to be kind of frustrating to be stuck at the house all the time, huh? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit challenging. Uh, we'll get to, you know, do a lot of Zoom calls and get on a computer, and uh, I've found a way to kind of get out of the house about every 30 or 40 minutes and kind of exercise and do, do the stuff that I need to do to keep going. But, uh, you know, it, these are the times we live in, and so we're trying to you know, do the best we can. But it, it's been interesting uh, – We've had some some learning moments too. We've learned some new things. I think uh, this whole mechanism of using video conferencing and that kind of stuff, not only from an internal standpoint, but on a national level has allowed us to really learn to develop uh, the ability to meet with more people uh, without having to travel as much. So I think you're going to see that kind of carry over into the future. I want to get you, because we talked about it right before we started the, the show tonight, I want you to talk a little bit about your experience at Wake. I mean, what a phenomenal year that was. I remember we were on probation then, and my local radio station adopted the Oregon Ducks. We were just going to adopt a team that hadn't been to a bowl all these years. We adopted Oregon. And they go to the Independence Bowl, and Wake shows up the first time in eons and ends up winning. That was 39-35, I believe. Uh, Bill, I think, uh, duly retired after the game. But what a special year your last year at Wake as a player, huh? It was. It was a, it was a very interesting year. Um, we had 22 guys out of a class of 25 that were four-year starters. Wow. So, you can understand, we, we kind of took our lumps early on, and uh, Coach kind of kept talking to us about, you know, you just keep working. We're going to get there eventually and get there eventually. We did. Uh, it was a very interesting year because Coach actually didn't retire after the game. He actually retired prior to the season and announced it effective after the last game. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. we played our whole senior year knowing – that, you know, for me, I was done anyway, but a lot of the underclassmen, that was coaches last year. And all those coaches were coaching at their on, you know, trying to find a job and, and figure out what their next move was going to be after Wake. So it was kind of a weird, weird moment, but it turned out really good. They got on a really good uh, run and played with some really good players, a number of them who had uh, played in the NFL. Mike McCrary, who played for the Baltimore mm -hmm. Ravens for a number of years as a defensive fan, John Henry Mills. Uh, was in the uh, NFL with the Houston uh, Texans, uh, the Oilers at the time. Uh, a guy named uh, Ben, uh, Big Ben, was an uh, offensive tackle that played for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So we had a number of guys in the NFL, and it was just a pretty unique thing. You know, we got to go out there and uh, do something that had never been done or hadn't been done since the early 70s at Wake Forest, and it was kind of cool. 
you know, trailing going in the fourth quarter, I went back and looked it up and had 516 yards of offense and not only got to the bowl game, but won it. The first bowl win since 1946 for, for Wake. So that, that had to be really special. And then, and then you told me too that, you know, later, you, you, everywhere you go, you end up getting the team the bowl game. I said, you might not better put that out there for the Rebel fans, though. <laughs> we've had a pretty, pretty lucky career. Everywhere we've been, we've been part of a turnaround in football and a, an experience of growth in football, whether that's going to Arizona State and going from a bowl team to winning the Pac-12 or going to Kent State and taking a, a football program that hadn't done anything and flipping it around in two years and winning the Mac West and going to their first bowl game since the early 70s. Or going to Georgia Southern and, and taking a highly successful one double A program and moving it up a level mm-hmm. and winning our first bowl game and our first conference championship in the first two years we were there. So it's uh, it's been exciting to be a part of the run. You know, my family only knows knows winning and knows bowl games and knows knows fun things. So, so when we don't go, my kids kind of look at me like, you know, what's going on, Dad? <laughs> Why are we not a bowl game? Yeah, exactly. You know, Georgia Southern is one of the best kept secrets in our country. I've I've known several people from there, especially in the broadcast world. And it's just, it's been a really, really good school. So that leads me into the decision to be, you know, the main decision maker there and to come to Ole Miss as a, a, you know, the deputy athletics director for Keith Carter. What was the discussion like when you talked to him and what led to the decision for you to come to Ole Miss? Well, we were going into year eight and, um, you know, we were sitting at Georgia Southern and, and I had kind of the mentality that I was going to be there about 10 years and then try to try to get myself to a position where I could get a job in the SEC or get mm-hmm. a job at, at, the, at the Power Five. And uh, we were down in a bowl game and, you know, Keith had taken the job here and the guy that had done the search for Keith's position had called me and said, hey, we're, you know, there's an interest Keith may need a deputy AD. Would that be something that interested you? And I didn't think, didn't even really think twice about it. And then within about two or three days, had a conversation with Keith, uh, search firm that Keith had hired to do the job and really, really became interested in his vision for what he wanted to do. Started to study him and research him. Felt like, you know, he was a guy that was important cog to the future success of Ole Miss in the sense that he kind of brought stability mm-hmm. to the to to the position with everything that had gone on. I was friends with Ross. I was friends with a number of people who had been here. Matt Lubick, and you guys remember that name from yeah, football yeah. coach. Matt and I worked together at Arizona State, so I'd always heard great things about Ole Miss. We had played Ole Miss uh, during my time at Georgia Southern, and mm-hmm. I kind of fell in love with the place. And really, you know, sat down and talked to my wife and my, my family and felt like this was a time uh, to move and uh, go into a place like uh, Oxford and Ole Miss was, was, was a right opportunity for us. Uh, everything we loved about Statesboro is just enhanced here. Uh, it's a bigger version of Statesboro. It's a bigger college town. The community mm-hmm. relationships are, are bigger. Uh, the fact that how intertwined the community and the athletic department are or, or, or on a bigger scale. And those were all things that were important to us when we took the Georgia Southern job. So when we looked at this job, everything was just on a bigger scale and a better scale. So we felt like it was the right move. Well, and visiting with Keith about you making the move, he was real, real excited to have you and the expertise involved in all of that. So tell us, tell the Rebel fans what the position entails and, and what you will be overseeing. So I'm a deputy AD for external. So basically anything that makes money, whether it's ticket sales, donations, or multimedia rights, or Nike deals, all the things that generate revenue filter up through my office. And uh, I spend a lot of time working on our marketing plans or communicating our messages and what we see, uh, the TV show, the season, a lot of time spent with that group, talking about the kind of things that our fans want to see and uh, figuring out ways to drive revenue to give to Keith so he can be as creative as he wants to be with growing our program. And I mean, that's really the reality, right? At the end of the day, Keith and, and Ole Miss athletics are going to go as we drive revenue. So mm-hmm. that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. In addition to overseeing the day-to-day with football, which means football scheduling. Uh, and when I first got here, it was helping coach Kiffin hire our staff and handle all the administrative side of those things, whether it's, getting courtesy cars, getting people housed, getting contracts signed. So it's, it's, it's that, and now it's moved into now kind of the day-to-day of 
managing football through the uh, Zoom world of mm-hmm. technology that we live through right now. And so that's really what it does, and it's, uh, it's really, really exciting. I think uh, I'm very honored, you know, to, to sit here and work for Keith and be in a position now where after seven years of sitting in the seat as an AD, I can sit in a meeting and, and as things come across Keith's desk, he can, you know, how would you handle this? What's your thoughts on these things? What, what, give me your perspective here. And so for me, it's a good point in my life because our conversation is very engaging and we problem solve together with the other administration administrators in our department. And I think where you have a very, very good athletic department that can problem solve from a lot of different directions. Yeah, and you mentioned it, but the, the part you didn't expect was a pandemic, you know, dealing with you know, this issue and all. But in, in just hearing Keith talk about it over the last several weeks, I think the athletic department has done about as good as it possibly could uh, in this, this, what I want to call an interim period before we get back to normal. Yeah, our, when we sat down, when this thing first hand, you know, hit us, it was – you know, all right, what's our priorities through this period, however long it would be. And and the one unique thing that Ole Miss now has is you've got an a unbelievable Division One athlete, athlete as, as an AD. I'm a former athlete. There's a number of athletes that are in administrative positions. Mm-hmm. So I will always say this, in the short time that I worked for Keith, student athletes were like the number one priority, right? So we began everything with – How's this going to affect our kids? How can we take care of our student athletes? And that's where you start to see the things like the, uh, the, the uh, Rebel Rebel Fund that was started, uh, the Fins Up Fund that was started to help student athletes. Everything that has been done during this period is, you know, how do we get them uh, food? How do we take care of them? How do we make sure that their coaches connect with them? How do we make sure that they're they're given opportunities to still strength train? And so we kind of start there and we, we work through all those problems. And then we began to work on the problems of, all right, what do we want to get out of our athletic department? We need to keep our fans engaged. We need to, we need to keep the business of athletics moving through this time period. And so it's been, it's been obviously challenging to work through, but I think our staff and our fans and, and our student athletes have all handled it with, uh, with, you know, done a great job with it. Uh, it has been interesting to see how college athletics moves I am a I'm not an office guy when I'm in the office I'm a guy that moves around the office I like going and visiting people throughout the day so it's been very challenging for me to kind of be surrounded by four walls so I I call a lot of people on the phone throughout the day just to check in with them and see how they're doing well that's awesome you know a couple of things you mentioned one the marketing part of this piece uh so Ole Miss gets Lane Kiffin I mean that's incredible when you think from a national standpoint his background where he's been and uh, just just taking advantage of having him as a head coach, you're already seeing him on national shows and all of this stuff. I know that your 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 mindset is focused on on uh, you know maximizing our experience with Lane Kiffin. I mean, when when coach takes the job, you you know that's one of the things. As I was sitting back, deciding on whether this was a good move for me, and I noticed who you hired, that was the first thing that jumped out at me is, all right, so we've got a guy, you know, that guy has been in the big game. He's coached the big game. He's won the big game. And not only has he done that, he's taken programs and turned them around. Uh, And so you have a guy that knows how to coach the game, how to recruit, how to do it at the highest level. And you got a guy that's a pretty engaging personality uh, through social media and through some of his other other ways that he engages people. So I think it's, it's a great opportunity for us at Ole Miss uh, not only to grow and build our football program with a proven coach who has a you know, huge set of credentials behind them, but also somebody that's going to be pretty engaging through uh, social media and, and attract a, a group of people and a group of fans to watch us through, the, the, through that medium as well. All right, you mentioned scheduling, being, involved, being over uh, football scheduling. And I know that a lot of that's way, way out there. Heck, we may have to change the schedule this year if things get, you know, wacky and out of, out of place, so to speak. And I always look at the future schedule and say, oh, we're going to play so-and-so in such and such a year. And I start looking at my age, and I'm like, I don't know if I'll make that year. So that's, that's kind of how far out we are in scheduling. But give us the philosophy in that, and, uh, you know, how do you see that down the road? Yeah, so when we sit down and we start with scheduling, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sit down and it's going to be – it's going to be Wesley Owen, myself, Keith, and Coach Kiffin. Those are kind of the four guys that sit down and we, we talk through philosophy and where we want to go. Keith will have kind of his, his philosophy on where he wants to be, which is the business side and the fan side and 
you know, the most exciting game to generate revenue. And Coach will have his side, which is the four wins that we can get in non-conference. And we got we got to figure out how to make both of those work. And that's where Wesley and I come in. But uh, at the end of the day, I think you're going to find that we're going to have a schedule that we have to play people that builds our brand. We have to play people that gets us on national TV. We have to play people that gets our brand out there for people to see. And we have to give our program the, the opportunity to be successful against those, those, those teams. But at the same time, we've got to build a, build a schedule that fans are interested in, right? Because at the end of the day, being committed as a season ticket holder, that's important to us, right? And so if we have a good product on the field, then we have to provide a good environment. Part of providing a good environment is having a good, good game, good home mm-hmm. schedule. Mm-hmm. So that, that's what goes on into all the mix. And so we try to find those name opponents that we can bring to Oxford that's going to get everybody's attention. Coach feels good about it. Uh, not necessarily that it's an easy game, but he, he feels like it's a game that he's got a chance to be competitive in. And then he feels good about from a, from a revenue marketing brand uh, side, and, and we kind of work on it. And the problem is right now we're talking about games in 28, 29, and 30 and, yeah. and all that stuff. But it, it's just so far out that, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch how those things unfold. Yeah, no doubt. It's fun to follow for fans to kind of kind of figure it out, and you have no idea – you know, what the landscape of football is going to be at that point. Speaking of landscape, okay, so you've inherited this deal and you're a former athletic director and uh, Keith is new to AD world, but a tremendous administrator and uh, was in fundraising for a long time. And now the staff is trying to figure out how to phase back into being totally normal. And each week I've asked Keith kind of what is the latest update? What are the conversations with the, the conference office and all? What can you enlighten us on? So, again, with everything from the conference office to the university to even to the athletic department, everything's going to be driven by what the medical uh, people tell us. Shannon Singletary sits on kind of our COVID-19 committee. He's, mm-hmm. he's talking to campus. He's part of the SEC conversations that they're talking about on a national level. So he's our resource in terms of guiding us on the next decisions to move forward. Uh, from the start of this thing, we have t- taken a very aggressive approach about trying to get back to, quote, unquote, whatever the norm is, getting kids back on campus, getting them in a position to compete, getting them back into school and getting them on the, on the field. Uh, we, we sit down weekly with Shannon, and right now we're in that phase of, okay, we're, we're starting to put a plan together to get people back to Oxford. So what does that look like? Uh, and I'm going to give you an example. If we sat down and we said the date of June the 15th or June the 1st, in our mind, prior to COVID-19, we would be like, all right, well, we've got to be back June the 1st. We'd show up the last day of May, and we'd show up June the 1st. Not ananymore. Mm-hmm. If you're going to go to work June the 1st, you got to kind of be where you're going to be at for about 14 days to kind of watch your symptoms, right? Because right. of where everybody, everybody's coming back from somewhere. And so this is a very safe area, but where everybody's coming from may not be safe. Mm-hmm. So we got to kind of have a period there where we watch – the symptoms of our employees, the symptoms of our kids, and before we can actually engage in on-campus activity. So that's a change. Um, we're talking about how we're going to move through buildings. When we get student-athletes on, back on campus, are we going to be able to have large gatherings or are we going to have to take a team meeting and maybe divide it up into segments so only 20 kids at a time meet or maybe we meet through Zoom as a team and then go to individual position meetings because they're smaller and we can manage that. Mm-hmm. And then the thing that a lot of people don't think about, which is, is, is an important part of this, it's not so much our healthy people, right? It's, it's our healthy people that we've been told by the medical professionals may be carrying this and not knowing it. So it's, it's the people on staff who may not be as healthy, right? It's the older mm-hmm. people on staff. It's the staff that go through and have had, whether it's surgeries or they have, you know, chronic disease or something like that that they're dealing with. We've got to limit their exposure that our young people may give to them. So we've got to think in that in those terms. And that's where masks come in and social distancing comes in. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks is, all right, when do we bring them back? What does that schedule look like? And then the education of how that has to happen moving forward that, you know, our new world probably will be, will show up and people will take our temperature and ask us some questions about if we leave, 
uh, Oxford, where did we go, who were we mm -hmm. with, and those kind of things, because that's all important information now in this new world we live in. Wow, I tell you what, it's uncharted water, isn't it? It's amazing. When you signed up to be an AD or an administrator, you sure didn't think this was going to be in your future somewhere. No, this was not in the book. In, in grad school, this, was, this, was, this one was not in the book. And, and so you take that same methodology that I was just talking about and then apply it to a stadium, right? How do you, how oh, do yeah. you have a stadium of 60,000 people? And how, do you, how do you social distance? How do you – I mean, that, those are all things that we have to go through. And, and one of the unique challenges of it is everybody can figure out a way to build something or recreate something to make it work. But the problem is what you don't want to do is if you do that and two years from now we go back to the way it used to be, then everybody's going to, going to want to get rid of all that stuff. So we have to right. figure out a way to reconfigure stadiums and do things that are safe that aren't permanent. They're temporary. So that we don't make this huge investment and make a bunch of these changes. And in a year from now, we're trying to go back to the way it was last year. Right. And so that, that's kind of the interesting part about this. Yep. No doubt. Well, Hey, I'm thinking about you guys every day. I know it's, it's a, it's a tough world to be in, but it's, it's gotta be exciting to be able to solve problems and help those before I let you go tonight. I know that you're a former player, so I know your heart is really with the players and we have some that watch our show, but what is your message to specifically our, our football players that are out there trying to do the best they can to stay in shape and, and hoping that the season is going to happen. Just, uh, just keep grinding away and getting yourself in shape and know that the people that are here working have your best interests in mind. They're not going to put you in a position at any time that's going to, uh, that's going to be adver adversely affect you. They have your, your best position in mind. And that's why we're thinking about when, when is it safe to come back? When is it safe to start practice? All those things are being thought of. And, and all you can do is control what you can control. And what you can control right now is your performance and how you stay in shape and what you do in the classroom. And you can let the administrators and the professionals and the coaches and all of us take care of all the rest. And I promise you, when we get you back in Oxford, it'll be in as good an environment as it can be. And we'll get as, get as ready as we can to hopefully kick off against Baylor in Houston. In Sounds good. Tom Kleinlein, thank you so much, bud. We look forward to having you down the road as well. Appreciate it. Hotty toddy. Hotty toddy. TK with us. When we come back, we're going to jump into some more football talk. We've got uh, Kevin Smith, our running backs coach, coming up next on Rev Talk. That's the sound of rush hour. Hello, recess. Mommy. Work from home is a lot of work. Even though we're a little further apart right now, we're still in this together. Regions is donating this ad to local food banks to shine a light on them as they feed our neighbors in need. Learn how you can help or get help at regions.com slash food bank. Regions Bank, member FDIC. Question, would you rather refuel while earning Exxon and Mobile Rewards plus points on every gallon? Or would you rather refuel while sitting through my sales pitch for an exciting new timeshare opportunity? Interesting, you'd prefer the points. Well, that's proof. People prefer earning and redeeming with Exxon and Mobile Rewards Plus over owning a condo that's actually my shed. Earn points in store and at the pump with Exxon and Mobile Rewards Plus. Sign up today. Terms and conditions may apply. Available at participating Exxon and Mobile locations. Right now is the best time to upgrade your appliances and lower your energy bill with smart choice rebates from Atmos Energy. As an Atmos Energy customer in Mississippi, you'll save up to $450 when you buy select high efficiency natural gas appliances. So use less energy and help keep our planet green. Call 877-616-6267 or visit atmosenergy.com slash smartchoicems for details. Atmos Energy, your natural gas company. We need the fans, alumni, former players all united and everybody on the same page, which is to win championships. We didn't come here to be good, all right? That's not why we're here today. We came here to be great. Hey, Rebel Nation, this is head football coach Lane Kiffin. Let's lock the bot Saturdays this fall. Become a season ticket holder today. Visit OleMissTix.com. That's OleMissTix.com. Hotty toddy. Our farmers work their operations from daylight to dark, and sometimes later. They deserve a lender that does the same. I'm Matthew Raff with the Mississippi Land Bank. If you make your living on the farm, this is your place. Since 1916, Mississippi Land Bank has worked alongside farmers in farm communities 
in North Mississippi. Come by and visit one of our six local branches. Mississippi Land Bank, this is your place. Visit us at mslandbank.com. Hotty toddy Ole Miss. Now for more Reb Talk, here's David Callum. And welcome back to Rev Talk. We're in our second segment this week. It was fun visiting with uh, TK, and now we're going to move into a new football coach like we do every week. Seems like we got so many new football coaches. Well, here's another one, Kevin Smith. Hey, Kevin. Hey, how you doing? Man, I'm doing great. Great to have you in Oxford. Oh, man, it's a joy to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. No doubt. I'm going to talk a little bit about Kevin. Of course, he's assistant coach dealing with the uh, running backs. And he's a Miami native, set 17 school rushing records at Central Florida, including an FBS single season record with 450 carries and 13 100 yard uh, outings in 2007. And then after uh, that, he got first team All America's junior year at UCF and was uh, selected in 2008 by Detroit in the third round of the NFL and went on to play five years for the Lions and had 17 rushing touchdowns there. He spent the last three years. Uh, with Lane Kiffin at FAU as an assistant coach there. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And he also uh, had a lot of success with the running back room there. Uh, the Owls had three straight 2,000-yard rushing seasons, and FAU had not done that but only twice in school history prior to their arrival. And uh, under Coach Kevin Smith, Devin Singletary, we'll get him to talk about Devin a little bit, uh, became the first running back in NCAA history to score 29 touchdowns in a season, 29 since – this guy, Kevin Smith, did it a few years prior. Just a few years prior, huh, Coach? Got uh, Yeah, just a few. Just a few. But he had 33, third all-time single season touchdowns, was named the Conference USA's uh, MVP, and that's that's really incredible. Kevin and his wife, uh, Tisha, have six children. Kevin Jr., Dennis, Kai, Denisha, Summer, and Paris. And a few of them are in the house with him now. What's it been like being trapped at home? I keep asking all the coaches. Well, you know, it's been difficult, especially because we are just beginning the transition. Uh, we brought her home and, you know, we were trying to get all our stuff moved up. We finally got that. And, you know, it becomes real tough when you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have anything to entertain the kids and everything is shut down. But uh, my kids are troopers. Uh, they've been doing a good job. So it's been good. Me and, me, and, uh, me and my wife has been able to spend some good time and my to-do list never stops growing. <laughs> Mine either grows every day. Uh, you know, I want to ask you this to start with. Uh, we're talking to all the new coaches. Of course, we've got a total, totally new staff. But each and every one of them at this point, when I've asked them about the rest of the staff, and everybody smiles and says, man, I, I know you got to be really pleased when you look around and, and see the staff that Lane has assembled here at Ole Miss. Absolutely. Uh, very talented staff. You know, I'm, I'm very young in this business. So, uh, you know, even with all the accolades that each coach brings, I'm, I'm very excited to uh, to work with these guys. Uh, work is fun every day. Uh, I think everybody has that we have a good mixture of personalities. And the good thing is that uh, most of the coaches, I won't say the neighborhood, but most of the coaches, we, we live around each other. Uh, I have a coach that lives directly by uh, behind me. I have a coach that lives directly next door to me. Uh, one about a block away. So uh, I think we're going to be a very tight-knit group. Like I said, everybody brings a lot to the table. So I'm excited to work with everybody. And, of course, uh, there's a ton of knowledge. So I'm excited to learn. Kevin, talk about your relationship with Lane and what went into your decision to come to Ole Miss with him. I mean, Lane Kiffin gave me a shot to, to coach college football. This is something that I didn't, you know, I didn't see myself doing uh, post-NFL career. Uh, but I fell into it. and. Lane's been awesome to me and my family. Uh, he's taught me a lot. Uh, I'm a sponge when it, in terms of uh, what it takes to, to run a program. I'm very intrigued by those things. So uh, he's been good to me and my family. Uh, I think from a personal level, uh, he's very close. And, again, I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to give, he gave me. You know, I mentioned uh, just a moment ago Devin Singletary. I know that you had to be awfully proud of what he was able to accomplish. And uh, when you look at the numbers – over the last three years, I think just the average fan may think of Lane Kiffin, you know, high-powered offense, but running is important to this offense, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, if you let me tell it, we're a running team first. Uh, <laughs> since I've been coaching, when I joined uh, FAU in 2017, 
Uh, as a team, we put up great rushing records. Of course, you have the individual accolades by Devin, and, you know, we have backups like Kareth White and uh, Gregory Howe that also has some uh, some stellar, uh, even in the backup role, some stellar seasons. So, I mean, we, we get out there in many ways. I think Lane's an offensive genius, so uh, running the ball is definitely a staple, and uh, it wins championships, and we were able to do that uh, two out of the three years we were there. Tell our fans, uh, Kevin, what basically is Lane's offense without without sharing too much, but uh, and what makes it so successful? I know people like to talk about balance, running, passing, but uh, obviously you've run very well over the last several years. But kind of give us uh, the cliff note versions of this offense. Right. So where I think Lane's evolved, he, he has a ton of experience. He's been doing it for a long time. Obviously, you know a lot of people know he got a shot very very young. Uh, but we're a pro-style offense. Uh, we have pro-style rules, pro-style concepts. And I think over time, uh, when we hired uh, Kendall Browse in 2017 and brought that uh, that Baylor system and that tempo, that up-tempo style offense, I think Lane is a, a mixture of, of both. Uh, and he's he's very innovative and he finds ways to give defense problems. And he's done a great job of that. And I, I say the one thing that I've taken away, and again, in my, my young coaching career, uh, watching Lane on the offensive side of the ball is his ability to make in-game adjustments uh, and almost to the point where, you know, we'll go old school and go, you know, sand lot, draw in the dirt type <laughs> thinking uh, because it's very important if you can take advantage of a defense and win that play. Uh, that's what he does best. And, uh, you know, so I think the numbers speak for itself, but, he, he you know, we're, we're a pro-style tempo type offense that – uh you know, we're going to try to create a lot of opportunities by running a lot of plays and being very explosive in the process. Well, and, you know, I, I know that you think about coaches that maybe had their style and stayed that way for years and years, kind of set in their ways. But here in the modern era, Kevin, it just seems like you better be able to adjust and and adjust on the fly in the game. And, and so you, you want to be pretty well-rounded, I would think, to get to a game. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you're, you're offensively, your goal is to make defense, defend every blade of grass. And like you said, uh, you know, a lot of coaches kind of set in their ways and, you know, bring their same playbook from program to program when they take jobs. And I think uh, Lane's done a good job of not only hiring great offensive coordinators, but, uh, you know, being very innovative and growing with the times and knowing that, you know, it's funny we're a running team, but, you know, and, and, Compared to, I look at myself as a dinosaur, and even the, the players that played before me, uh, this is football has evolved to more of a passing league, uh, where you have to play in space at least. So, uh, you know, he, he's done a phenomenal job, and you know, I, I, we're, we're going to continue to grow and continue to find ways to get better. So, you had the pro career, of course. You know, we like to brag about some of our running backs at Ole Miss. One of them was Deuce McAllister. Oh yeah, dude could go. What do you think about Deuce? I love Deuce, uh, and I, you know, until I got here, well, I, I won't say until I took the Ole Miss job, but until I kind of, you know, did my 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 football history and, and dove into the greats that uh that played before me, I didn't know he came to Ole Miss. So for me to be here and and, and know his career well and know how good of a, a pro he was, uh, you know, it's, it's it's an honor. I'm excited to be here. No doubt. That's the the perfect back for you in that room. Now we got some goods. I want to talk about the kids in a moment, but the perfect back, somebody that can run over you, run around you, make good, you know, receptions as well. What would you describe as the perfect back for this offense? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't like to use the word perfect, uh, but the, the, the kids that, that I like to recruit, it, it's like a marriage, uh, mm -hmm. especially with my coaching style. But uh, from an attribute standpoint, uh, feet is number one on, on my board uh, because some things can develop uh, because due to resources. Okay, mm -hmm. when, when you go from high school to college, you're going to have better training resources. You're going to have a better training regimen. Uh, you're going to be able to eat a lot more than you will do in high school, especially depending on what type of family background you come from. But uh, the feet aspect of it, I compare it to like basketball in the NBA. And, uh, you know, at some point with age, uh, your, your, your skills are going to diminish. Not your skills, but your physical skills are going to diminish. So I look at it like a basketball player. And the, the, one, the one player I always uh, talk about is LeBron James and how, you know, great he will still be even when he can't dunk on people because his overall game 
will still allow him to be a great mid-range player, uh, be a great free throw shooter, things that uh, you can still be at an elite level when, you know, your vertical decreases and Mm -hmm. you're not as fast and you're not as strong. So for me, the one, uh, uh, the one thing that will never change is being able to have great feet and, you know, having it naturally, okay? Uh, I look for players that, you know, I use this analogy that that have batteries included. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, along with, you know, the things that uh, I see that I think uh, can be developed along the way, uh, you know, feet, uh, just natural catching ability, uh, you know, because I'm not looking for a player to, be perfect because you gotta you gotta coach that's the reason why we're in this business we gotta we gotta add on too so uh i'm not one who you know who really is intrigued by a super super fast running back now obviously based on our level and being in a number one uh conference in college football uh there's there's some uh physical specimens in this league and uh they're big fast and strong so you have to have uh some ability to make plays and make long plays. But I would just say, you know, having natural feet, having good hips, uh, not tight up top. Uh, those are some of the things that I look for and know that uh, the things that I bring to the table as a coach, I will be able to help that player progress and maximize his uh, ability. Now you're inheriting Jerry and Ely, who uh, had a phenomenal year last year, Snoop Connor and others. Just talk about your room. And I, I know that you, you guys, I've, I've talked to some of the other coaches and it is what it is. We, we've had this coronavirus and we missed the spring. And so you've missed some evaluation on the field to this point. But what do you think about the room? I think I have a chance to, to be special and, and be an elite company. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a player hard and, you know, i when I was able to lead the country in certain categories, I took that same mindset to uh, to coaching. And, you know, when I took the job, it was no different than when I took my first job at FAU. And as soon as I landed in Oxford and, you know, I landed with Coach Kiff and we went past the fans as soon as we, we got to the football building. Uh, while Coach was being a head coach, I was diving in the film. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, we have a chance to be really, really special. And I think not only because – Ely, and I like to call him Prime, Prime Time, like Dion, because he plays ba- baseball and football. <laughs> yeah. uh, but Snoop and uh, Isaiah and uh, TK, mm-hmm. uh, we have a chance to, to really, really do something special. And it, it comes more, I'm excited about their ability, but the one thing that I did get to see before the pandemic was how hungry those guys are. And you can have all the talent in the world, but if a player is not coachable, and if a player is not uh, self-sufficient and self-made and, you know, have that self-motivation and that drive, uh, it's going to be very, very hard to be elite. And uh, we have that. So that's a good starting point. And uh, they, they're hungry. They, they want uh, they want to continue to learn and continue to develop. Uh, so I'm excited about the room. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. But one day at a time, as soon as we're allowed to get back in the building, uh, well, we're we're gonna we're gonna chip at it and and we'll see what it where it falls and when it's all said and done. But I expect us to be right at the top of the country, uh, just like we were at FAU. Uh, and you know, this this room has some really really talented guys and and some really some some pro prospects in the next two or three years. So I'm excited to get to work with them. I think one of the things, Kevin, having watched them too in the past a little bit, you're going to be really pleased with the intensity. Uh, out of some of those guys in that room. I, you know, Jerry and I get to hang around Jerry in a little bit more because of baseball. Uh, but just a great personality away. But when he gets between the lines, wow, he turns it on. He really does in any sport. Yeah, and, I, that, you know, that's important. And, I, you know, I, I saw I saw a little bit of that, of the, you know, when we were conditioned and, you know, to be a competitor, you got to compete in everything you do. And those guys brought that same intensity when they were running sprints and running gases and going through our fourth – quarter program so uh I I think we're going to match well because I'm very very intense uh but at the same time I want to be the best set of eyes for them uh in the game of football uh that I can be and and help them uh to to understand the game how I understand it see how I see it and then at the end of the day uh, this is a performance-based uh business and we plan on getting to it I forgot that you came with Lane on the plane and landed at the tarmac with all those people. What was that like? 
it, uh, it, it was an experience. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot different than FAU, and FAU's been great, but just the fan base, and it was, you know, my first welcome to SEC football and seeing how passionate uh, Rebel Nation is and seeing how passionate the people at Oxford are about winning and, you know, championship coaches, and it was great, I tell you. Uh, so I got off the plane, and if anybody knows, I'm the first person off the plane. And I joke with Lane, you know, uh, I had on an all-black suit uh, with a white shirt and a, and a black tie, and I kind of looked like a security guard. So, I, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> I, people, you know, obviously no one knew who I was. So I always tell people they just thought I was a security until they uh, introduced me at this press conference. That's great. So, oh, by the way, this is not security. This is my running back. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. I love it. I love it. Hey, before I let you go tonight, and we really appreciate you visiting us, we're going to have you on some more down the road. But uh, you you had a wonderful college career. You had a, a good pro career, and then you jumped into coaching. How has it been to move from the player that has kind of control of everything into the – the coaching world, and I know you're a young coach has kind of got into this, but how, how's the transition been? And just tell us if you're enjoying it. I mean, it, you know, for me, it was it was quite natural. Uh, but I will tell you, there's a difference between, you know, being able to play and setting 17 school records and, you know, being able to perform at an elite level to getting a, a, a young man, a player to to – perform that way and there's a it's a lot a uh, lot of psychology mm -hmm. to me that goes into uh, being a good coach or a coach that can get the max out of the players uh, but it, it's been awesome I'm a player I'm a player at heart I'm a player first uh, and so you know I may be a lot different than uh, say you know the coach that kind of got in this profession without playing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but you got to have a good mix. And I tell you, you know, as I continue to grow in this business, uh, I, I always stick to this model that the biggest room in the world uh, is the room for improvement. And, you know, since Lane's hired me, uh, I, every single year when it's when it, when the year is over, no matter how we finish, uh, before we have our exit meetings with our player, uh, I kind of have a little powwow session with the head coach who – He's been doing it a long time. And the first thing that I asked him are what areas can I get better in? And he's been molding me and grooming me since 2017 and, and kind of telling me, okay, well, you know, you did good here, but you can be better here, whether that's on the field, whether that's recruiting, uh, whether that's being a head coach of your own position. Uh, but it, it's, it's so far it's been a fun joy. I think that uh, I'm, I'm very relatable and I can relate to the players and, you know, the, I think the number one factor of, uh, you know, kind of that transition into being the coach is just having genuine love for the players mm -hmm. and wanting to help groom them and be better men on and off the field. And, you know, anybody who, who's played for me knows that football kind of comes second, as crazy as that sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never started off a football meeting in the morning and talk about what we're going to install play-wise for this day. Uh, I read body language when we come in, you know, someone in the corner might be look sleepy and, you know, you know, let's tell the group what we did last night, why we're looking so sleepy or whatever the case may be. And just to make sure that, you know, it's when a player knows that you love them beyond the business side, because football is a business, no matter how you slice mm -hmm. it, when they know that you care about them, uh, then the trust comes and then you're able to not only coach them hard, but, uh, get them to do things that they can't do themselves. So, uh, you know, that that's kind of going to be who I am. That's my staple. And uh, the transition has been really, really good. And I look forward to a new challenge. Uh, I, you know, I, I look at it like this. When I first took that FAU job and I walked in a room with Devin Singletary and some of the other guys, I was leaving uh, a UCF backfield that, you know, had kids like Adrian Killings and had a lot of talent. And uh, my first nature was like, oh, wow, what am I doing? UCF had just only won three games. And, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, but I end up, you know, being able to coach three running backs in two years that are all on 53-man rosters. And so, uh, you know, that experience has uh, helped me to get where I am now. And I look forward to a new challenge and, not being, you know, not only helping them accomplish their dreams on the field, but 
you know, I want them to become better men, and I'm honored to be a part of their lives. Hey, that is awesome. And you got some in the room that could could be on a 53-day roster here before uh, a three-man roster for too much longer. Too. And, and and that that is my, uh, you know, everybody, when you're a player, you have personal goals, you have team goals. Uh, my goal is to push as many running backs to the NFL uh, as I can that I come across. And, you know, I call it pushing the product. Selfishly, mm-hmm. that's my individual goal. And if guys perform, they make it there. And if you perform well individually, uh, we'll win a lot of football games. Kevin, thank you so much. Great visiting with you, and uh, hopefully for too much long as we inch closer to the season, they're going to free us and let us all get back out in the world a little bit safely. But uh, nonetheless, get you get you guys back in here and get ready for the upcoming football season. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You and your family stay safe, and uh, I look forward to coming back on the show. All right. Thank you, man. Kevin right, Smith, our running back coach, brand new running back coach at Ole Miss. Coming up next, Possum Ross. We'll have that in just a moment. In sports, success is measured in the number of points scored, in games won, and in championships earned. At Shelter Insurance, we measure success in the quality of our products and services, in how we support our communities, in being there when you need us most. In fact, 9 out of 10 people surveyed with a claim would recommend Shelter to a friend. To find out how Shelter can be there for you, visit shelterinsurance.com. We're your shield. We're your shelter. Hi, this is Gant Boone with Oxford University Bank. You've heard about our Casasa Cash Checking Account paying 2.5% interest on balances up to $50,000. That interest could, depending on your balance, pay for an unlimited cell phone plan for you and one other, or pay for two gas fill-ups per month for an average-sized gas tank, or maybe a nice mint on the square is what you desire. Regardless, this is real money we will give you for doing three things you are probably already doing. So stop in today or visit us online at liveoxfordbankoxford.com, Oxford University Bank, member FDIC. Hey Rebel Nation, this is head football coach Lane Kiffin. Let's lock the bot Saturdays this fall. Become a season ticket holder today. Visit OleMissTix.com. That's OleMissTix.com. Hotty toddy. For over 50 years, Mississippi Asthma and Allergies Board Certified Team of Allergists have treated patients in Mississippi by identifying triggers that cause patients trouble and creating personalized treatment plans. Now with offices in Jackson, Ridgeland, Meridian, D'Iberville, and Oxford, it's like we're right next door when you need us. Treating adults, infants, teens, and Ole Miss students. Find the Mississippi Asthma and Allergy Clinic near you at msaac.com. Mississippi Asthma and Allergy, helping Mississippi live life to the fullest. That's the sound of rush hour. Hello, recess. Work from home is a lot of work. Even though we're a little further apart right now, we're still in this together. Regions is donating this ad to local food banks to shine a light on them as they feed our neighbors in need. Learn how you can help or get help at regions.com slash food bank. Regions Bank, member FDIC. As we navigate the COVID-19 crisis, O'Reilly Auto Parts is dedicated to serving you. We've been deemed an essential business, so our doors will stay open. We encourage you to buy online, then pick up curbside. Together, we're committed to getting through this. Hotty Toddy Ole Miss. Now for more Reb Talk, here's David Callum. Hey, welcome back to Reb Talk. We're in our third segment this week, and boy, we had a good visit with TK and also Kevin Smith, our running back coach. And we've got a special treat for you coming up here. Been a friend of mine a long time and looking forward to visiting with John Possum Ross here in just a moment. I told Possum, he got to wait. I got to read an announcement first. That's my story of life. <laughs> Possum is, I got to read that stuff, you know. Anyway, if you didn't know it, the classic games are up. We're going to add some more of that too. But via podcast, you can go to Inside Ole Miss Athletics. Uh, Possum will remember all these. Uh, basketball, we've got the 1998 win at Kentucky in Lexington that Keith Carter played in, the 2013 NCAA tournament against Wisconsin, that, that victory there. There's three football games up with more to come, but you might want to go catch some of these. They're shorter versions. The 2014 win over Alabama, the 2014 Egg Bowl, 
also the 2015 win over Alabama. And we're going to dig deeper and get some more of those up for you. But several fans have asked us about doing classic games. And so the university has agreed to do so. And they're, they're at Inside Athletics, right where you can find uh, Rev Talk as well. We're going to visit now with uh, John Ross, better known as Possum. We're going to have to ask him where he got that from here in a moment. But uh, Assistant Director of Equipment Operations at Manning Center Services recently retired. Uh, how many years, Possum? 25, 6? That was 26 and a quarter. 26 so, and a quarter. Uh, yeah, that's you were work. figuring that 13th check when you retired. <laughs> 26 and a quarter. Wow. And uh, he was assistant. Uh, oh, he served as Assistant Director of Equipment uh, Operations and the Manning Center since 2005. He was head equipment manager from 96 to 04 and served as assistant equipment manager for two years, 94, 96, and uh, dealt a lot with the purchasing part of Ole Miss and dealing with Nike uh, directly and handling a lot of that as well. And he's from Olive Branch, Mississippi. I pick at him all the time being a conquistador because that's what, <laughs> that's basically what he is. But uh, Possum's married to Cindy McGregor Ross of Oxford, and they have a a couple of kids, John Clark and Taylor, got a great family, and we just talked about both kids are at Ole Miss, huh? Both kids at Ole That's Miss. That's correct. Uh, one, yeah, yeah. Uh, one will be a junior. My daughter will be a junior next year. My son will be a, a fifth year senior. <laughs> he fifth shirt. year senior. That sounds like you and me. <laughs> That's right. That's we may right. have been we may have been six year seniors for us over with. Uh but recently Possum at the uh Rebel Choice Awards won the We Are Old Miss Award and it basically goes to an individual for their dedication in service to student athletes. And Possum, I kinda wanted to start there and and, and let you address that. The cool thing about what some of us do when we're, we're not coaching or, you know, we have different positions. I'm a radio guy. You were handling equipment all those years. And, but we get to be around the athletes, elite athletes. And I'm not about to tell you, ask you who your favorites are. I know how you feel about that. You get mad at me. But there are tons of them that you, you've got to grow to know. And it's just fun to be around them, isn't it? Oh, it is. I mean, it's, you know, just to get to know them personally. And, and you know, the – the cool thing is there's there's so many great guys, you know, that we've dealt with through the years, you know. And, like, as an equipment person, you know, you kind of go around and you talk to people, but you, you talk them as support staff and everybody's like, hey, I know such and such a great player, but is he a great guy? And, you know, when you hear that, like, oh, yeah, such and such a great guy, and you're like, oh, that's great. That makes it even better, you know. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, it's it's just been – I've been so privileged to get to – you know, be around so many uh, great people and from people from all walks of life and uh, get to know them. Uh, and uh, that's been really cool. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, here's what's weird for me personally. Of course, Blake Barnes, who, who you worked for for several years, retired here. It seems like it was yesterday, but now that's getting pretty far back in the rearview mirror. Now here's Possum retiring. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, but talk a little bit about what went into the decision and the new company that you're working for and all, because uh, I, I know we're going to need to give them a free plug and nothing else, right? <laughs> well, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, now, so I, you know, really, you know, been thinking about the last year or so, you know, had the chance to retire and, you know, really tough, you know, it's really weird, you know, with this virus going on and even the thought of, it hasn't really hit me yet, you know, that I'm not actually an employee of Ole Miss, but, um, you know, just the opportunity to start my retirement and try another career, it's still in sporting goods, selling stuff, I'm working for BSN Sports, uh, be calling on high schools and, you know, businesses in the community, you know, anyone that needs clothes, we, mm -hmm. we're open with a lot of different brands, you know, uh, one of them being Nike, you know, which I know real well from all the years at Ole Miss. But, uh, you know, just really been on, you know, they talked to me last summer. So I kind of thought about it all through the fall. And then they called me and said, you know, hey, we think the first of the year. And so I was kind of like, well, you know, let's give it a try. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of kind of tough. But like I said, I'm always going to be a fan. People, A lot of people probably won't even know I'm not there anymore because they're going to see me. I, I've loved the Rebel since I was uh, old enough to think for myself. So, <laughs> so that's not going to change. You know, I'll be around and, and uh, you know, look forward to seeing it from the fan side. Nobody calls you John Ross around the <laughs> athletic park. Everybody calls you Possum 
Where did it come from? Where did possum come from? Well, I was the youngest of uh, three boys in my family, and my two older brothers were a good bit older than me. They were like eight and ten years older than me, but the brother that was eight years older than me, they, they tried to stick him with the name, uh, some of his friends, because I was always – but I would chase them around. You know, I was just – you know, trying to see whatever they were doing. They're like, here he comes, tagging along like a little possum, you know. But, so he didn't want the nickname, so then they stuck it with me, and I'm like, hey, I mean, it's it's served me well. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who don't know who John Wallace is, but they know who possum is, you know, so <laughs> – I love it. I love it. You know, uh, when I think back through the many years and, you know, obviously you had a job to do, but getting to meet all these incredible people, you, you have told some wonderful stories through the years. And, and since some of my, my buds in the athletic department, they, they heard we're doing possum. I said, you got to ask me about this. You got to ask me about that. And I'm like, now, wait a minute, guys. If, if possum tells some of these stories, it may not be good for him. He's got to keep some <laughs> stories a secret, but uh, who was the head coach when you first, first started so when so I was a student manager since 1989 so it's mm-hmm. been over 30 years but so coach Brewer when I first got hired that was the summer he got uh, terminated or whatever and so Tuberville came then and then you know on and on so um, what what was uh it like to to transition I guess uh, from Billy uh, to Tuberville, uh, you know, I know that Coach Tuberville uh, seemed to be very personal, just like Billy was. Oh, definitely, in, in different ways. I mean, you know, Coach Brewer, you know, I loved him. Uh, he, he treated me good. And, uh, but, you know, then you, Coach Brewer was an old Miss uh, alum, you know, played here and all of that and grew up in Mississippi and uh, – kind of hard-nosed, blue-collar type guy, you know, didn't ask for a whole lot. And then you get Coach Tubb in here, and it's like, hey, I've been at Miami, Texas A&M, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. And we're like, uh, okay, Coach, uh, let me let me, let me me go check on that, you know. And it's like, oh. and, of course, you know, at that time it was tough financially. You know, we were on uh, probation, unfortunately, and uh, I can remember – Let's see, he, he wanted to change the pants, you know, the stripe and different things. And, man, we just patched together. There was no Nike contract then. And uh, I, I think we wore – his first year we wore, like, Russell jerseys, Wilson pants. And then we thought we were a big time uh, – we got a company called Sports Bell to sponsor us in 96 and 97. And, wow. And then, you know, and then in 98 we went back to Russell Athletic. And, I mean, at that time, Russell Athletic was cream of the crop, you know. Right. We were, you know, but we always wore Nike shoes. So, but, uh, but yeah, that was the biggest difference between those two guys. So, All right, so, so people want a funny story. Uh, if you were asked that point blank, tell us, tell us an inside story nobody else knows. I probably know a bunch of them, but anyway, what would be the first <laughs> thing that popped to your mind? Oh, gosh, I mean – it's hard, but I guess one of my favorite that comes to mind, and uh, a lot of people won't know it, of course, uh, you know, Ken Crane's still there, and, and mm-hmm. uh, Ken's like a brother to me. I mean, we've, mm-hmm. we've known each other, actually, since – the funny thing real quick about Ken, we knew each other as kids in Olive Branch. Oh, uh, wow. His uh, stepfather's parents lived right behind me, and so we played ball as kids. And so then he moved away in seventh or eighth grade, didn't see him for a number of years. And all of a sudden, one day I go to college, he recognized the car. I said, you ought to be a manager. He comes in 1993, I think it was. And uh, his favorite story is, is Blake hired him. I said, Blake, you need to hire this guy. He's a good guy. He was the ninth man on an eight-man team, and he's still here. So that was Blake saying, you're the ninth man on an eight-man team. So It worked out for Kim. For yeah, Kim. and Coach Brewer fired him the first day at practice. I said, ah, don't worry about it. You're good. So, but, uh, <laughs> But so, Ken, you know, we were always uh, partners in crime. But in 2003, we were about to go to Auburn, you know, massive game over there, and uh, Eli's senior year. And so that Friday, we were – I was sitting in the equipment room, and I think we'd won four or five games in a row. You may remember, we were on mm-hmm. a good winning streak mm-hmm. and because uh, we lost those two non-conference games early. And uh, Coach Cut came to me, and he said uh, – hey, possum, here's my lucky hat. 
And uh, he said, you know, I want to be sure it gets to Auburn. I want to have it for tomorrow. And I kind of looked at our GA and um, I said, hey, this is your job. You know, like, be sure the hat gets here. You know, and all that. I kind of smiled. You know, I was like, you know, hey, you know, do this. You know, on it. And Coach Cut was in a good mood. It was Friday. We're about to head to Tupelo and fly over. And so, anyway, didn't think anything else about it. Honestly, I forgot about it. You know, <laughs> so that Saturday morning is a two thirty CBS game. We're setting up the locker room, and again, the <laughs> the tough thing for me is I'm a fan as well. So mm-hmm. I mean, I'm on edge, you know, and work and all of this. So a lot of people tell you during the game I wasn't worth much because I'm into the game as a fan. <laughs> Don't ask Possum for any, you know, he's he's liable to bite your head off, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> but. Um, so we're setting up the locker room, we're going around, and, and I hear Ken talking to this GA, and I'm like, hey, what, what's the deal? What's, what's going on? And like, he says, he's lost the hat. I said, guys, I said, this, this is not funny. I said, uh, I mean, really, it is not funny. I said, don't play jokes. I'm not in the mood for it. And Ken goes, because Ken likes good joke. As Ken will say, I like the good joke like the next fellow, but this isn't a joking situation, you know. <laughs> So, Ken said, well, you know, Coach Cut, he's, he's a smart guy. He said, um, it's on you. He said, but what I'd suggest is when he gets here, you best just come clean. You're not going to be able to trick him, but, you know, because he's going to know it's not the same. I mean, we had tons of hats, but, you know, he's, we're on a winning streak. He doesn't want to, you know, that was his hat. And we're like, where is the hat? He said, I don't know. I don't know. So, anyway – the team gets there. They're rolling in. We're on edge. Everybody's probably thinking we're nervous about the game. We're nervous about how Coach Cut's going to react about this hat. And we're like – so, anyway, he decided to try to write his name and try to copy what – because he had put Cut in it with a check mark. That's the way Coach Cut had it. Gave it to him. He knew right away. And Coach Cut was not happy. So, anyway, we get through it. The game gets going on. Totally forgot about it. So – you know, go through, you know, great comeback win. You know, I actually saw it on replay the other night. Amazing final drive. Mm-hmm. Of course, we hold them out, and the Auburn guy drops the pass. And, you know, we win and all this. And so everybody's going nuts. You know, we're thinking we're about to, you know, we're leading the West. And Ken jumps on my back and's like, whoo, thank goodness, thank goodness. I know. I said, what a game. He said, no, I mean, the game's great. But he said, if we, if he would have caught that pass, we never would have heard the end of the hat. <laughs> I said, man, I totally forgot it. You know, I was like, whoo, I mean, man, thank goodness. <laughs> and then that, that had to become Cut's new favorite hat. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and then we get back to – Cheap low that night, and we're going back, and the hat was on underneath the bus. I get oh, when wow. we moved, the GA never took it. I was like, oh my goodness! I was like, man, <laughs> thank goodness! Isn't that wild? And and see, nobody, no fans would even even know that was going on in y'all's I world. I know, I know. I'm what are never, some What are some of the crazy requests players have? I I know I, I hang out with you guys. I've been been down the place a bunch, trying to steal a hat from you or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, all the time. But uh, I know that players are kind of quirky about, you know, superstitions and, and all that too, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I mean, they all kind of have their thing, you know, and, and they know on game day, you know, you, you're you just going to give them whatever they need and, uh, you know, try to keep the peace, keep them happy, keep them in the right frame of mind. So uh, a lot of those guys are pretty savvy. They know how to play the system, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's amazing. I, I can't really think of anything offhand. I mean, they all had, you know, certain things, you know, uh, from the quarterbacks, the way they want the ball and, you know, different things like that. And, or the kickers, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, you know, like the kickers would come to you and they'd be like, hey, we want this kind of ball and everything. I'm like, to kick. I said, well, here's the thing. As I said, the quarterback is going to pick because – the kicker, if we can't score, it doesn't matter. If we don't get in field position, you know, I said, I'll get, we'll get the ball in that you need. But first, we got to get in scoring position. And if the quarterback's not comfortable throwing that ball, 
us and we've got a problem. So, <laughs> so I love so it. Just gonna be honest with you. You had to be diplomatic, didn't you? That's right. Absolutely. Uh, Possum, when you started as a student, how many, just ballpark figure, how many people were associated with the equipment room versus what Ken now has obviously today? Oh, um, I would say my freshman year, there were nine student managers and we had Blake and uh, a guy named Mike Zulo. So we had two mm -hmm. full-time people. And, you know, now we probably have, so we had counting me this last year had three full-time people and we probably had, we have some that, you know, just come in and work practice, but we usually have around 20 to 22 students, you know, to work practice. So, wow. That is amazing. Yeah, it is. Takes a lot. It's, so, is it hard for somebody to contact you guys and say, I want to be a student manager or how do you, how do you go through that process? Um, you know, a lot of it's word of mouth, you know, like a lot of times there'll be another manager that has a friend or, or, you know, someone will say a coach will go to a school recruiting a kid and say, man, I've got a great manager and, and you know, they'll call us or send us an email, something like that. But uh, when I started, I mean, <laughs> You know, you just didn't know, you know, before internet and everything. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it used to be just hard to know who to contact. But now it's not as hard. You know, it's usually like a, a coach or someone like that that we see at camp or something like that. you got to come up with a second story. I'll get in trouble. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's another one you got? <laughs> I know you have to filter through them and kind of say, oh, I better not tell that story. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, Oh goodness! Um, trying to think a funny story. Um, God, I'm trying to think. Hmm. Well, you mean you mean funny or just favorite stories or favorite whatever, funny? Know? It don't matter. Yeah. Um, you know, probably one of the uh, the neatest things was when. Um, oh yeah, I think of this one. It was the funniest thing. Uh, speaking of coach tub but uh in the 97 egg bowl oh yeah we're down there and you know again it was that was nerve-wracking by the way yeah definitely definitely and uh but you know uh in typical there was a few people down around the sidelines you know different people back then uh kind of had a lot of extras around but uh but anyway so you know we score there at the end and you know, while, you know, and back then there weren't as many bowl games, even though that win made us seven and four, you know, we didn't know for sure we'd get a bowl game. Now, mm -hmm. if you get seven wins, you're, oh, where are you going? We're going somewhere, you know. Right, right. But anyway, and, and, you know, both teams were really good. Anyway, we score at the end and should have known, you know, he would go for two or whatever, and, and we do, you know, and, of course, we win the game. But uh, Coach Tubb looks at a man on the sidelines, one of his friends, and he says, hey, uh, what do you think here? Because there was a timeout, TV timeout or something. He said, hey, should we go for two here? And that guy was like, I, 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 I. he said, ah, oh, don't worry about it. I've already made my decision. <laughs> I thought that guy was going to have a heart attack. He was like, what, what, what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how would you like to be one of the, you know, one of the guys on the sidelines is just a friend of the coach and you choose and it gets out and on the, in the clearing ledger. This dude yeah, was the one right. that picked it. <laughs> I remember right. uh, Corey, Corey Peterson caught the ball on the two-point conversion. Great catch, great play, and ran in him later. Uh, and Corey said, uh, he said, Mr. Gallo, if I hadn't caught that ball, he said, I think he called me DK back then. He said, if I hadn't caught that ball, what would happen? I said, we'd have shipped you to Delta State. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm uh, just kidding, you know. Delta State's pretty good, too. But, <laughs> but uh, what an incredible – Incredible game, obviously, uh, that one was. Do you still hear from a lot of players that, that have I, left? I do. Uh, that's, uh, you know, period. I, I was trying to tell people as I could, hey, I'm still going to be around. Here's what's going on, you know, and all this. And it, it's, you know, it's uh, it's hard. Like I said, I, uh, I was looking forward to the spring game because I was mm – -hmm. uh, the M Club was inviting a lot of people. You know, they're trying to get more people to come back and – they were going to have a little reception, but, you know, that all got called off, you know, and just to see people and, uh, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of guys through the years, you know, and you just, uh, it's like, wow, you know, and, and, you know, still, even though with social media, you know, people have heard, you know, but like I said, I don't look at it as that, like I've 
I mean, you retire, but I mean, it's not like, I, I mean, I'm still around, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'll, you know, do whatever I can to help Ole Miss always. I mean, I'll, I'll never, uh, uh, I guess until the day I'm leave this earth, you know, I'm always going to be a rebel. So. Well, uh, you need to write that book though. <laughs> if you if you and Langston get together and write a book, I'll buy it if it well, if well, has the right stuff in it. <laughs> hey, I had a hard time thinking of a second story. So. <laughs> yeah, I, this is pressure. This is like live radio. This is pressure That's right. <laughs> for sure. Well, you know, we we appreciate you for one thing, and uh, I know that, and a lot of people may not know this that they think of possum in football, but I know how much you love our baseball program, our basketball, program, all oh, our man. programs. That, at Ole Miss, and you attend a, a lot of uh, games and all, and you'll still be out there. And if I need a spotter, I'll let you come up in the radio booth. How about that? Yeah, but the problem is, you got to remember, I'm a fan. You don't have to say possum. You can't be yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know it. I think our guys yell anyway. So what the heck? <laughs> hey, pay attention to the game, okay? <laughs> yeah, that, that reminds me. We, we were down in uh, Little Rock for the for the hit game. Why? And, uh, I had my buddy Jack Gadd was spotting and Rick McKay and uh, you know we got the stop and I tried to find out who's carrying the ball and who, who who made the tackle and both spotters are gone. I'm like, what's the deal? They were high five in the back with Steve Davenport and so I thought, well, at least they're high fiving with the boss at that time, so we're all okay, I guess. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it was not the greatest call for old DK, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, look, we had tons of fun times with you. I know you're still going to be hanging around and all and. Uh, Appreciate you spending a little time with us. And, and listen, oh, yeah. congratulations right. again on the Rebel Choice Rewards. Don't take that lightly. That's from some a lot of people who really love you. Well, well, thank you. It means a lot. Like I said, and I'll be around anytime. You know, I, I'm I'm here. So, <laughs> <laughs> John Possum Ross, great to have him on Reb Talk tonight. It's been fun to introduce you to some people that have surrounded the program and. Maybe we'll have to have Ken on sometime. He's got a lot to live up to after oh, possum. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Hey, thank you for joining us this week on Reptile. We'll see you again next week.